Okay. Welcome. This is Artists Design the Future, Kiela Smith and Laura Weathered. Kiela Smith Upton, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so we want to share with you a follow up to two weeks ago when we, when Laura in particular, but Artists Design the Future presented a variety of case studies of ways that art space um, has been approached, um, developed or not succeeded, but um, this builds on that and kind of takes you to the next step of what concepts and, and what ways work. I just wanted to say before she starts or as our opening that, for example, Artists Design the Future, which is about um, to form as a worker cooperative to provide development of real estate cooperative art space um, and consulting. We, before the project even got to where it is now, there's considerable work. And I want to kind of call it pre-development work, but I often say pre-pre-development because there's this need for uh, as Laura puts it, the burning soul or souls who really uh, uh, stay with the idea, start building and developing relationships, start kind of quote unquote, selling it not only to themselves, but to the larger community, that there is time that goes in to really putting some legs to an idea before you get to even what Laura is going to cover um, for the rest of the presentation. So without further ado, introduce my partner in good trouble, Laura Weathered, <laughs> to take uh, it away. Okay, so the first, where I wanna start, we're just big on co-ops. We're forming a worker-owned co-op in order to develop more co-ops. So we're a catalyst. And I wanna share this short two minute video about what co-ops are. Wow. Look at this. 94% of people believe company culture is important to. All right, we don't need that. How am I making full screen? There we go. A cooperative is a type of business that is Laura, owned can you and pause operated the video? for the benefit of the people. Can you yeah. pause the video? You're going to have to. The organization. Cooperatives are structured around seven principles deeply rooted in democracy, economic participation, and sustainable growth of both the business and the community. How are cooperatives different? The cooperative business model is an alternative to conventional business. Cooperatives foster democratic values and practices coupled with long-term thinking. On the outside, cooperatives look like any other business, but inside, they are very different. They are owned and controlled by the people closest to the business, not outside shareholders. The owners of a cooperative can be the customers, a group of store owners, residents, farmers, or employees of the organization. In fact, there are many different sectors of cooperative businesses, utility co-ops, credit unions, and banking co-ops, insurance co-ops and mutuals, producer co-ops like farmer co-ops, housing co-ops and resident owned communities, social co-ops operating in childcare, education, transportation, and many other applications, purchasing co-ops, food co-op grocery stores, customer owned co-ops and worker owned co-ops. Cooperatives have been successfully utilized across many industries, countries, and continents. They are proven to strengthen local and regional communities, sustain economies, and elevate the quality of life. Learn more about cooperatives and how they operate in your community, nation, and across the world. Join us in building a better world. Let me get back to my uh, document. Here we are. 
now. So, um, so we're big on co-ops. It um, applies to a lot of industry. And I think it also makes a whole lot of sense with non-for-profits in the sense that the folks working for the non-for-profit know eminently more about what they're doing in the project than a board which actually owns the non-for-profit through governance. Anyway, what Kiel and I are doing are setting up a for-profit worker-owned cooperative in partnership with the Near Northwest Arts Council, which is a 501c3, because we embrace the same values about that co-ops are built on. Democratic control, volunteer, open membership, economic participation, autonomy and independence, education, training and information, cooperation amongst co-ops and concern for community. So um, I wanna encourage everyone, if you've got questions, um, ask, cause it's important if, um, as we go along, we can anticipate um, uh, questions about what we're presenting. I have um, a whole list of resources that you can refer to um, afterwards, and I, I'll put them, where am I gonna put them? In, in the menu or not in the chat because it's too much information. Anyway, right now it exists as a PDF so everybody can have um, access to that. And we're gonna share some time at the end for general discussion, uh, questions and answers. So one of the things that Liza asked is if you put together a group of people, where do you start? Um, and a needs assessment, a core group that recognizes the problem, gets together and shares its knowledge about needs and expectations and kind of with examples, case studies, you know, the potential of a cooperative business model that would satisfy their needs. And one thing I learned from co-ops is that oftentimes um, a farmer didn't like the market or how much things cost or how to get his produce to market and oftentimes it was one guy who saw cooperatives as a solution to that problem and created a larger entity that served everybody with a similar need. Um, so the second step is to organize and it just takes three members to found a cooperative corporation. Um, you wanna do market research and member analysis. This is part of writing a business plan. How many more people like you share that problem and would recognize a co-op membership or co-op ownership as being a solution? <clears throat> Several weeks ago, we talked about a feasibility study and we kind of worked it out as, as far as phases, collecting information, finding models. Um, it's the basis of a business plan. And phase two is if there's sufficient resources available to support your plan, what are your steps in creating a concrete strategic plan? Um, the next step is developing a business and organizational plan. And I wanna talk about, there's many types of co-ops. It can be a leasehold where a group of say artists identify the need for studio exhibit and production space. And they decide as a group to do 
a leasehold or a master lease. And so you don't always have to own the property um, or create a capital campaign. It may be that you're just creating a working group um, to occupy space and figure out how much it's gonna cost, what member share is, um, how you collectively uh, make decisions about the business and also be flexible enough to allow members to come and go without having to reorganize your whole business. The next point would be to draft bylaws. And one of the things that's really quite exciting about internet is you can pick up bylaws all over the place. It's, it's one of the things that I share with our housing co-op that we planned 20 years ago. Um, so there are also wonderful legal resources available through colleges and resource centers um, that can help you put that together. And bylaws are always written after you do your business and organizational plan. So there's some important decisions that need to be made. Um, and then the bylaws give you the structure for making decisions and to be recognized um, in your state. So you incorporate, you sign up with the state, it takes three people to start, but it's nice to have you know, a strong membership group committed to operating the business. Next step is simply to start operations and implement your business plan. So I referenced that there's uh, different ownership types. A leasehold is one, and that's where you take a master lease on a building and then you operate it. Um, market rate is a for-profit entity that um, uh, establishes its business in order to either break even or produce a profit for its members. Um, limited, limited equity is a particular business plan where the profits are reinvested in the group. And this can apply to studio exhibit or incubator space. Um, it can apply to permanent sustainable work live space. So the business plan is who are your members? How do you make decisions? And how much does it cost? Development models. Now, why isn't this moving? Um, how do I go to the next page? Um, try the arrow. Arrow. On your, on your, yep, there's the, that's the next page, right? I don't know, it doesn't look, okay, it is. All right, so um, development models include non-for-profit, for-profit, or you can do joint venture. So maybe you have a corporation that wants to sponsor an incubator and you figure out some legal partnership agreement that gives you the resources to start your project. Um, one example I can give of a joint venture is um, a professor at the School of the Art Institute. Um, she and three friends found a nice industrial building that they wanted to put their studios in and they couldn't afford the full cost of the rehab so they, their plan was to develop three owner-occupied units um, at break-even costs for themselves and to develop two units as market rate um, condominium units, um, which raised the money to do the construction on all of it. So it was interesting, creative, um, 
and it raised the money they needed in order to do their project. Um, this is a quick rundown and what you need to do to create permanent space and how you use, bring a group together to talk about. There's wonderful resources, especially the California Center for Cooperative Development. I listed here and we could go to their page or not. Um, I went to the, uh, I used the University of Wisconsin Center for, Cre for Cooperatives and did training for trainers to learn how to transfer this information of cooperative decision-making into larger groups. Um, I know also that the Academy for the LA Co-op Lab has um, a lot of resources available for you guys in California. You can sign up for technical assistance. They have online learning. Some of it's free, some of it costs money, but it's a great, they call themselves a co-op catalyst, which I love. So um, we list resources for seven principles. A co-op was founded in England in the mid 1800s because a bunch of workers, I don't remember what, they, what the company was that they worked for, but the company was much like Pullman in that it gave you a job, it gave you housing, but you had to pay for all of it and you had to shop at the company store and it, it controlled the economics of every aspect of their life. And they couldn't find enough rice, beans or candles at an affordable price. And so they, as a group, did group discount buying and that was the founding of the first co-op. So it was kind of immediate and firsthand and um, it reflects the values of co-ops and kind of do it yourself, figure out economics, but the value is you get more control over your own life. Um, I'm gonna, oh, I also wanna share that there's a lot of, um, places to go, um, how to start a co-op. They're online, they're free. You may have to register, but you can do the training online at your own pace. Um, the USDA, the United States, um, I didn't, it serves farms and rural communities, but they're real big on co-ops and they have wonderful kind of how to start uh, your own co-op and the steps that you go through. What I do wanna talk about is that the, let's see, co-op creator is a Canadian-based education um, resource that's got clearly stated plans and resources. And another group, Start Co-op, has a new initiative uh, funded by AARP that will support individuals and groups who are over 50 funding startups. So it's kind of an online, I think it's eight weeks, um, you get support and talking through your idea and how to how to found a co-op. Um, and they have uh, enroll in lean co-op planning is a place to go that really helps you think through the process of business planning a co-op, who your market is. Um, they also provide bylaws starter kit um, in Chicago, we have the Co-op Resource Info Hub at chicagocoop.net. And again, LA's got a wonderful catalyst. So um, I also listed 
uh, videos that are available online um, about different co-ops, the history of co-op, TED Talk co-ops. Um, Metis Construction is a three and a half minute video about a group of contractors in Seattle that organized themselves. They wanted to get through recession and slowdowns as a group of small business. And they ended up investing two years of time in creating a worker-owned co-op that helped all of them uh, as small business get health insurance, et cetera. It's, it's really heartwarming to kind of see how collective action, it's not easy, but um, it helps solve the problems of evening out the business, <clears throat> getting rid of middlemen and kind of financing projects um, in a way, because you're a bigger entity. Um, Are you gonna show it? Or oh, not? I could, sure. You gotta, you gotta do the same thing though. All right, let me click on it first. Let Getting paid stop. in construction is tough. Yes. Send a notice with Level Set today so you can get paid. Level Set is the fastest, easiest, and most reliable notice service in America. Metis Construction was founded in 2008 as an LLC. Prior to becoming a co-op, we were essentially a collection of subcontractors. About five years ago, we all came together at the Rhine House project. When we came here, this was uh, an old building that was falling down and didn't seem to have much of a future. This was going to be a much larger project. It kind of expanded as the project gained speed. That was really the point at which we kind of achieved the critical mass to realize an idea that we had long been thinking about, which was the idea of reorganizing as a co-op. That really started the fire that turned into Metis. We spent about two years figuring out how to do this. The co-op is a worker-owned company. Um, it's also worker-controlled. That means that on an everyday level, we operate like any other construction company. We have project managers that make decisions. But on the governance level, we are democratically governed. And all of our members participate in the decision-making process. Once the idea of becoming a worker-owned company was put on the table, it was wholeheartedly embraced. There was like about 20 people in the company at the time. Everyone was offered ownership. Like 18 of us took it. So, I mean, that was pretty, you know, that was pretty resounding. This was just at the end of the recession here. Everyone had had a couple of pretty rough years. In times of recession, of economic downturn, as a worker-owned company, we can all elect to take lower wages. So that gives us a lot more flexibility through difficult times. With an independent contractor, all the responsibility is on yourself. And then, so with the co-op, we share the burden of the company. Any small business owner knows what goes into running a small business. The lack of sleep, a lot of stress, and to be able to work with a group of people that you really like to work with and to share that risk and share that stress makes working through those problems and those crises actually something that draws everybody together and is really rewarding. From a business perspective, worker-owned companies tend to be substantially more profitable and more productive. You could see with those people that converted to ownership, just a general sense of this is mine. Being part of a co-op, I mean, I feel prideful about my work and I feel very responsible for the well-being of the company too at the same time. There's a value in joining together with that common purpose. If you go in for a $100,000 hospital stay, you're going to pay the $5,500. Monday night, we had a member's vote that is now made healthcare 100% um, for full-time employees as part of our Metis operating agreement. For our worker owners, there's a lot of advantages that come with this. They participate, they share in the profits. The best way I can describe it is the experience of community, of being a part of something that's, that's bigger than me, but 
connects me to the work we do in a way that I wasn't connected to it before. It's a pretty amazing experience to walk into work every day and feel like you're doing some small thing, you know, towards making the world a more just and equitable place. And I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, my. <laughs> All right. Okay. Should I put my PDF back up? You're still presenting. Okay. Let me do that. All right, so actually, we're done. I wanna open it up for questions. I know we kind of charged through that quickly, um, but it's 2.18 and I wanted to allow plenty of time for questions and brainstorming. So are you gonna leave the PowerPoint up? Uh um, I could, yeah, let me see. Try using the arrows in the keyboard. Huh. Yeah, that first page is more. Hmm. Just do um, hit escape. Okay. All right. I really like the way you laid this out. I mean, you know, for presentation. Um, and I'm thinking, is this a good model for like an existing organization or one for when you're, well, where to start? Um. I think so. I mean, it helped Kiela and I think about what have we done so far and what we need to do. And we're, um, we're, we've kind of reoriented our next steps as, you know, our, our core group is, we're looking for artists to kind of buy into this idea and, um, so we need to, to kind of bring them into the room and talk about, you know, the pain points, shared needs. Um, and because they don't readily know about co-ops or ownerships, or even thinking about that as a vision, we can share our experience and models of ownership. So, so yeah, we're kind of right back at that needs assessment, but we're also doing, we've done quite a bit of market research. We've done our feasibility analysis and have real numbers. So it isn't always a linear approach. Sometimes, you know, as we as we are building our co-op, we're talking about member benefits amongst ourselves as workers, but we're also talking about member benefits as far as artists and what they want to get out of it. Yeah, I like the way this is really organized, like, you know. Uh, so are you using like the, um, in step six, are you using the draft bylaws from uh, NWAC? No, um, as we're, let's see. Um, my experience with, with NWAC is that, we want, and this is why I'm kind of at pop-up research, because I'm really interested in how you work with artists and 
how we might reorganize ourselves as a worker owned co-op of artists that are about exhibit opportunities or working on placemaking activities or so we do have a set of bylaws that recognize that we can do economic development as well as arts planning and support but um there are because the co-op laws in illinois have changed um in the last couple of years, there's uh, new opportunities to create bylaws that kind of fit your business plan better. So what's important with bylaws is you don't want to start with the legal language, but you want to start with what your services, your business plan, your market, how you make decisions how people become members, if you're going to entertain investors and what, um, you know, is it a gift or is it something that you pay back or is, you know, there's a number of ways, but you want to make your business plan suit your values and your needs and then draft bylaws that support that. You know, I'm always shaping and shaping and reshaping the bylaws, you know, for the Phantom Gallery Chicago Network. You mm -hmm. know, I'll go through and I'm like, uh, you know, now I got Grammarly, you know, it's straightening it out. <laughs> you know, the grammar is straightening out, you know, missed, uh, you know, hiccups or, uh, but for the last, like since 2012, uh, I, when I posted those bylaws, it's went through at least five revisions. You know, uh, when I add new board members, but I still leave like the board members that were founding that were like yourself, an advisor, I still leave those, you know, and, and, and recognize those that have worked and helped shape the panel gallery. Right. You know, um, maybe the membership, you know, after 12 years is something that needed to kind of like tweak a little bit, you know what I mean, uh, benefits that they get. But it's on, I think it's a like not a shelf project, but it's organic and it's still like I'm always editing it and going back, especially after trial and error and things that really work and things that blew up and really didn't work, you know, um, because there's other perspectives of people that question the bylaws. And we, you know, like we're always like new board members, we're always kind of like, it's not always in a draft form, but it's always safer to say draft, draft, you know, uh, and the year, you know, on it, you know. Um, right. And I've even shared it on like Facebook, you know, the group where you can load up files. Mm -hmm. And that way other people that have joined can look at what they're joining. Because like a lot of times we join groups on like Facebook, or whatever, and we don't are there bylaws? Are there any other structure, you know, that make them accountable? Right. Well, I have to say that, um, um, you know, my patience with legal language is minimal. But when we were putting the Acme Artists Cooperative together, we got a very strong set of bylaws from another artist community. And we looked at it and kind of tweaked it, make it fit ourselves. Um, and then like many artists, it sat on the shelf. And when we had real um, problems to contend with, um, some of the loudest voices wanted to throw our decision-making process right out the window and kind of crucify people. You know, they were just, um, they were passionate and they didn't have time for structure. And in fact, what really held the community together was that we had this legal document that said, you can't throw that out the window. This is what you agreed to. 
you signed it. This is the, you know, if, if you want to change it, now is not the time. This is the concrete kind of black and white um, rule of the organization. You accepted it and now figure out how to make decisions within this format. So it really um, worked to cover us when tensions were high and um, some of the loudest voices weren't the smartest people in the room. <laughs> they usually aren't. Because <laughs> they're so busy not listening and trying to make their own point, you know what I mean? And get heated. You know, that's where those heated discussions come up. You know, right. so. Um, One of the problems that I had in directing a non-for-profit, um, when we when we came to do this housing project, I realized that the board wasn't the smartest people in the room, that we needed to hire a development team to, to um, you know, people with the professional experience who had skin in the game. They didn't get paid unless we were successful. And, and so we hired our lawyer, our financial consultant, our architect, um, based on, you know, here's the project, here's our values. Um, this isn't a market rate development where, you know, they understood the purpose and they worked very hard um, for making that project a reality. And so, um, I don't know if it's true in capital campaigns, that's not a field that I have a lot of experience with, but we certainly, you know, in raising money for our project, it came from the artists and from every <clears throat> uh, resource that was available. Foundations weren't helpful, but public money was. And so we needed to hire consultants who had the professional experience and the respect um, of those different agencies to buy into our project. So, um, so the role of the board in our development was one of governance. It was um, one of, are we on track? Um, is it legal? Where are the problems? You know, they're, they were volunteers. And so it was more of, um, you know, just oversight supervisors. Was this working, you know, in, was the organization, was the NWAC organization working within its legal limits? And so um, that was enough for them to kind of chew off and debate. They were also very effective at um, kind of negotiating um, when problems and questions arise about the project. Um, they were good at kind of negotiating between, um, you know, disagreements amongst different parties. So they were, they were very good at that. Do you have anyone that has a law background on the board or do you, did you seek that? Yeah, we do. We've got two folks and Kiela is on our board and her experience is in providing legal services for small business. And another one of our board members um, has a law degree. Um, each Can I time. clarify? Yeah. My, I don't provide the legal services. I have access to them, to right. the ones I sell, to the ones I sell. 
Right. Okay. But you're, you work as a consultant. Well, I just sell their services, but I have access to right. legal uh, shield, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I, I just wanted to be clear. Don't anybody call me for any reason. <laughs> right. So when we were setting up our business, we, we were, I mean, when we were doing our strategic planning, um, we had a great <clears throat> financial consultant who was working at the University of Chicago, um, doing financial planning for the university, but he was also a jazz musician. Um, we have um, a, a lawyer on our board um, who taught theater as a PhD in New York for a lot of years and then went back and got a law degree. So um, we do have that, but we readily make use of free pro bono legal services through um, the University of Chicago as a legal clinic, specifically, um, one aspect of it is for co-ops. Um, we make use of the Law Project for Economic Development who recruited uh, lawyers for us who are interested in real estate. And we also worked with the lawyers for creative arts. So, um, so free legal advice is readily available. It just isn't, it's, it's not, it, you have to kind of recruit people before a crisis. It's not good for. Um, is, the, is the other word vetting, um, you know, like if you don't vet that person, you run into all kinds of chaos. I, before moving to um, Illinois or in Chicago, I belonged to a housing co-op, 17th Street Commons. And mm -hmm. that was downtown near the state capitol in Sacramento. And we got into all kinds of trouble because one of the uh, our co-op members' boyfriend was a paralegal at McGeorge um, Law School. And he was just still a student, right? And he took this project on for his girlfriend and it became the worst nightmare. People were bailing out of there because he became like a lawyer. He just would lost his mind with, with the with, what he assumed was power as he was, if, and if we're not savvy and reading contracts as owners of, and members of a co-op, if we don't really maybe vet and go get our own legal support person to help us get through that, you know, you're gonna get sued. <laughs> you know, right. you're gonna be liable for all these decisions. And it, it got really ugly to the point where uh, even the judge, you know, like had to cap this person, but we didn't do our due diligence in turning stuff over to a paralegal to have the, you know, to decide the fate of what we were doing as a, as a co-op. And they lost that co-op. I moved out here. I bailed on them, and, you know, but they had, okay got me in and I was ready to like, I'm not gonna be committed to this. And people were kind of getting out of there and like, did you take the hint? We moved, you know, but you guys are the ones that pulled me into this co-op and sold it to me and, you know, mm -hmm. thought it was gonna be this whole great thing for artists. But when they started, I don't know, like within those contracts started renting their co-ops. And so you have more renters that just don't wanna deal with the business of anything, the legalities of anything. They just want to pay their lease and, you know, pay on their rent and they're not even engaged in uh, mm -hmm. activity, you know, uh, of other co-op members. It's just, you know, you got to really think those things through because you're, you're, you're um, creating a community, you know, right. of people that are invested with the same kinds of interest. And when you lose that by, taking your shares and just not paying attention to the legalities. That's probably why I asked that question about, you know, legal people on your board of advisors, you know? Well, the, um, I have to say that my experience in co-ops is, and this is kind of shared with lots of co-ops. There's a third 
of the membership that's involved, actively involved on the board of directors. There's a third that kind of watch over it. They feel comfortable with the decisions that are made, but not enough to get on the board. And then there's a third that are quite happy to let you do whatever you want. The danger comes when you let the loudest voice in the room take over, throw the legalities out the window and run the way they think it should be run. You know, it's, it's, it takes away the power. Of the, and so you don't want to let that happen. And the benefits of staying involved is that property management costs are reduced because um, you've got people who are invested in the community. Um, you want a changing leadership. You don't want the same people making decisions because they kind of get lazy and, you know, they'll so you want that voluntary membership. What's really kind of nice um, is when new members get excited about it and you know they haven't lost that volunteer spirit yet and they're willing to do a lot of stuff and run around and make friends with everybody. Um, you need that kind of intergenerational resurgence of interest and energy. Um, and then when we created the, the co-op initially, it was to be a supportive community environment that was affordable, not just for the first generation, but as soon as the legal limits, and it only took 10 years, the, the city, lent us more, probably about a quarter of a million dollars to support um, our development. Three quarters of a million, $750,000. Um, and it had 10 year limits on it and it dis the obligation disappeared. Well, all of a sudden everybody became very capitalist, very real estate, you know, it was kind of like, all right, Let's get rid of this, let's get rid of that. Okay, now it's market rate. And so in the end, that spirit of what we founded was legally taken away from the community, but the success of shared responsibility and, you know, frankly, folks made money off of their real estate investment. And how can you? fault them on that when that was the only real money they ever made in their life. Um, so I would go back to, uh, we became a condominium and it took away that limited equity provision. And I would go back to being a cooperative. And it's like, if you really need to make money um, off of gentrification in your neighborhood, you know, go do it on a more speculative project. Don't expect this um, project or this investment to do it for you. And quite a few people who went through our workshop training learned the financial aspects of real estate investment, and they found other partners and made other projects elsewhere. So it was, it was, it was beneficial to everybody who kind of came through the training. It was like, you could do it too. Here's the structure. Here's the toolbox. Here's the sets, you know, the steps that you need to go through to attain that. And, um, so your horror story of a cooperative is, <clears throat> A real one, but real life, <laughs> real life, <laughs> right, but, right. Uh, it it uh, was a learning curve there, uh, especially you know, like it was an artist co-op. Um, 
even charging us to use the community room. I don't know if you guys charge members over there. You have to pay a fee to use the community so room. Far, so far, they've kind of sorted it out in the sense mm -hmm. that if it's a private event, you don't have to pay. You have to show proof of insurance for um, uh, kind of a, a use within it. Um, but if you're hosting an event for public access, you have to pay a fee. And it's a policy that I disagree with because now the board is kind of motivated to monetize a community asset and rent it out to strangers. And that's not the purpose of the space. So yeah, that can run amok to uh, like sometimes it does here when people, <laughs> well, I mean, we all host events and parties and just be respectful of each other and go by the bylaws that everybody agrees to and stuff. But I think that a lot of the problem with that co-op is that a lot of the members rented their units and therefore you had less owners involved Mm -hmm. you know then in absentee owners that didn't care they were just trying to get out of there then they were just didn't sell their unit they just rented it you know right. so it became problematic and I got out of there the, uh, with capital area development agency because I worked for the city of Sacramento I had a meeting with him and a private meeting and he was like you know what yeah you got a family you have a daughter to think about you get out of there because he already saw the writing on the wall and all already saw they were financially in trouble. And then uh, the CADA was gonna take over that because that was one of their properties that they were managing. Um, and so they were gonna take over it, which they could get more money from people that were flying in with state and government. And you know, downtown is just ridiculous for how much uh, they're charging um, for rents you know, in the Midtown area, especially anything close to the state capital. So they were basically trying to get people out of there. And we just fell into that loophole of having a nutcase, you know, manage and um, represent us in court, you know. So I don't know how it all fell out. I think everybody lost, moved out, you know, or something, rent raised, and they turned it into something else. I haven't even went by and visited since I, you know, even when I was in Sacramento, I didn't have a need to go by there and visit them that place. But um, yeah, that's just one of the things I'm saying, like a, a, live, a, a live experience with investing into a co-op. And it wasn't like I invested in the beginning of it. It had been there like for years and, you know, the community had already been cultivated. Um, you know, I was friends with a couple of the artists that were in there and they worked for me on various projects as consultants when I was at the commission. You know, so we kind of had that, you know, in common, but some of the other people, it was, it was like, you know, screaming matches and all the rest of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's better ways of collecting, co making collective decisions. And, and both I'm talking about from a non for profit organization where your purpose is kind of supposed to be clear, but I remember, you know, board meetings with board members who showed up and kind of questioned a program in the middle of it because, you know, there was no remembrance of where we were coming from or why we made those decisions. And it's like, why are we wasting time questioning this when it happened, you know, two or three years ago? So, there's there's kind of you know it's it's a difficult team building exercise you know keeping folks focused and you want to hear the tensions you want to hear the problems you want to offer solutions but um it's it's well, like you said, you kind of rewrote the bylaws in order to, to fit the situation better. Yeah, but I put a draft on there. One of my uh, directors, um, Michelle Walker at the Arts Commission, I had a, a manual that I created for the arts education and outreach program. 
and um, which all the forms that we asked them along the way, I just consolidated it into one <laughs> the resource. And she was like, I'm not going to read that. Just put draft them. You know yeah. what I mean? So that if it changes, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not bound to what we said because it's a draft, right? And she was, I'm not going to read that. Just put the draft on it and then put days when we put the date on it, when we revise certain sections of it. And it's become a more of a working document. And that's sure. where I got that from with, with the bylaws. I'm not reshaping them for situations. I'm reshaping them because it's a draft and maybe I need to flush that part out a little better because that was a weaker part of the, you know, of the, you know, of the, the, the bylaws. Now, Kayla asked me an interesting question in the chat. And it was, uh, did the co-op you live in require education sessions for you to become a member and then have an ongoing training and education? You know, and I said, nothing of the sort, you know, it was just more of an introduction. So, but we always think of these things as this is business. Mm -hmm. Anytime we're talking about raising this kind of capital and, and investing, the, you know, you know, thousands and thousands of mm -hmm. dollars into something, this is an, an investment. And I think that it is important that we have teams of people that come in and present during our board meetings, you know, to keep people on track, especially new member orientation kind of thing, you know, that are new to co-ops. I fully believe in co-ops. I just was in one that had members that failed, you know what I mean? Or I wouldn't have invested my money that way. Um, and then all along the way, I work co cooperatively with people and, and, you know, but I haven't invested into another co-op. Mm -hmm. you know since that happened um but anyway this is a two-way conversation and i don't know if anyone else has any um like two cents to, to put in um i had just a question <clears throat> not related like to bylaws and what have you but the uh concept of uh co-op uh you know what how are you guys going to be marketing this to let people know about the opportunity? That's one question. The other question is, is like, what would be the uh, uh, demographics for people who would be attracted to this kind of an artist's uh, 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 model, living model? Uh, you know, because we see a lot of young artists and they can barely pay rent uh you know and then you know is that an oh would that be a more established individual that you guys would be targeting uh for being in the co-ops established meaning not necessarily older but more economically established um so that would that's one of the court that is the question that i have that's a great question kiela do you want to answer it <laughs> I mean, she and I talk a lot about the missing middle. Um, and so that's our target audience. And the missing middle is low and moderate income. They can't compete in market rate rents or purchases, but they also don't qualify for public housing. So mm. they they earn enough money to support the family. But I mean, we're talking about maybe a family of three earning $50,000. And so it's very difficult with that kind of income to qualify for a house, mm. uh, you know, coming up with 20% down. But a co-op is much more affordable, and this will relate to um, young families, um, emerging artists. Um, we really identify our prospective audience to be intergenerational. And oh. so it's an alternative to rent. And if you can show a history of paying rent for, you know, five, six years, you can afford to be a co-op homeowner. Mm -hmm. And so what our intention is, is to have informal info sessions for the next couple of months 
talking about this idea, demonstrating that it's affordable, anticipating from artists that they share with us what their pain points are. And I remember, you know, 25 years ago when we were advertising this space, there were artists who showed up who said, I'm living on somebody's couch. I'm a full-time artist, but I have absolutely no income. And we're like, you know, you need a sugar daddy or somebody else. We can't, you know, <laughs> we're, we're not an artist fellowship. We're not um, raising all kinds of money to support you as an artist. You got to figure out how to support yourself and then come back to us and we can show you how you can, uh, you can own well, and, the collective. And, and since you put me on the spot, one of the things that was going through my mind when you asked that question uh, is that um, as much as that is sometimes the case, Rhonda, it's not that it's always that it's the, uh, it's the word I'm thinking, it's the, the like desire. So part of an intentional um, trainings that we want and, and think are important to implement is you've got, we'll have multi-session trainings about cooperatives and the cooperative principles and making sure everyone's on the same page with that. Cause those are the only folks that you really want to be in community together, owning together, but that we not stop there. And we either, um, collaborate with the local chamber, um, or others that do train entrepreneurial training, which includes financial education for the artists. Like for example, in South Shore, the South Shore Chamber has a partnership with Sunshine Enterprises and they have actually rolled out a specific arts and makers cohort 12 week program. Um, and they do some one-off workshops specifically for creatives. So we recognize that that is a need as well. So I hear you, I was, in that situation myself when I was a young person and I wanted access to that. I was, I still am that missing middle, but I remember being a young person, young mother looking, wanting to buy something, but saw a $99,000 house. And because of the low income I was making, I was like, how does anyone afford a house with $99,000? Like I couldn't even fathom that a $99,000 mortgage it's not that much, it's less than rent. But I didn't even have that basic understanding. So there's some things, you know, that definitely have to be taught. Right. For example, like they have these programs where you are a first time homeowner, they take you to, and you get a certification, you know, cause you went through and then you come to another workshop and you get another certification so you can just get ready to deal with, um, even a closing that was so hard. I was so scared <laughs> during knowing that I was going to spend that kind of money that I was going to spend and sitting there at a closing and everybody's doing all this stuff around you. And you're like, unless you have a real estate attorney with you or someone that just, that's just what they do. It's a horrifying experience to close on a house. It is. It, it's, it, it is. And that's the, one of the benefits of a real estate cooperative is you don't have that well, one, you don't have that experience. You may have the need to qualify certain things, but you don't go through closings like that for the members to, to have their share of ownership in the cooperative. But I hear you, Alpha. I mean, there's, there are some programs out here that even uh, take it one step further, you go through, if you did want to buy, you know, in a traditional way, you go through those education programs and Excuse me. The city just relaunched what's called a micro market recovery program in a small part of South Shore, and it's in other neighborhoods. And once you go through the training, you get fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars to help you buy that house. So there's all I got that my when I got married, my husband and I bought a house. We got thirty thousand dollars, and I think Laura didn't. You had that with your development, right? We did as condos. Um, my husband and I qualified for $40,000. So that was part of our down payment on a condominium. It was $40,000 of a uh, mortgage that we didn't have to pay. We just had to um, not 
resell within 10 years. If we did, awesome. we'd have to pay a portion of that back. Mm -hmm. So the city was really creative in using home dollars, HUD money. And um, so I don't think that program's available anymore, but I really do think that um, the uh, Department of Housing and foundations are very interested in progressive ways of rethinking home ownership. Mm -hmm. and, um, one of the things that they're afraid of is that co-ops develop those tendencies just as Alpha outlined. And so they want to see non-for-profit, um, cooperative education and training be available for the years for new members as it goes along to keep them in good shape. And so there's a lot of co-ops that were developed in the South Shore in the 70s that kind of ran into trouble because they didn't have that ongoing training. Mm -hmm. um, and right now there's um, in real estate investment firms that are buying up troubled co-op buildings, making everybody a cash offer, buying the building and then renting it at market rates. Mm -hmm. And so we really do have to guard ourselves against vulture investment, extractive right. investment. We have to protect the resources, you know, the building stock that's there. And I think by, you know, a co-op that owns housing is a small business and mm. it needs, it needs the commitment of the members to keep that business in good shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're running out of down to our last two minutes and thank you guys um, artists design the future for your presentation.